Hello everyone. Welcome to this, your conference for teachers of English. Today, it is my honor to introduce one of our presenters, Juan Jose Reyes. In order to get to know him better, I'm going to read his biography. He is a second year doctoral student in educational leadership and policy analysis at the University of Missouri, Columbia. Originally from Tegucigalpa, Honduras, JJ holds a BA in Foreign Languages from the National University of Honduras and a Master of Arts in Teaching English as a Second Language from the University of Illinois, thanks to the Fulbright Last Bow program. His current research interest is on higher education access for Latino low income and refugee students through career technical education. Let's welcome Juan Jose Reyes. Hello, hello everyone, and welcome all attendees of the 13th International Conference for Teachers of English, New Perspectives in TEFL in the Post-Pandemic Era. My name is Juan Jose Reyes Valladares, and welcome to my presentation with the title, Advantages and Challenges of um, English for Specific Purposes in Career Technical Education. It is um, a pleasure for me to be here, and uh, I really hope that you enjoy this presentation. There are two objectives uh, for this lecture today. <clears throat> the first one is to examine the advantages and challenges of incorporating English for specific purposes, or what we call ESP, in um, CTE curricula, or we, what we called career technical education. A second objective would be to explore best practices for ESP curriculum design and instruction. So there, uh, this presentation is going to have two parts. <clears throat> the first half of the presentation will be devoted to career technical education. And this is for you to understand the background of uh, this modality. Uh, and then we'll devote the second part of the presentation to um, ESP, English for Specific Purposes. So in the first half, I'll talk about some background information on career technical education, uh, implications of neoliberalism in the labor market, uh, evidence of social mobility, challenges that um, persist in career technical education and some implications for higher education. And then we'll move on to the more um, pedagogical part of curricular design for ESP specifically. What are the advantages and challenges of ESP implementation and best practices for ESP instruction? And I'll finish with some recommendations for stakeholders. So I wanted to give you some information about me first. Uh, <clears throat> I graduated from the National University in Honduras with a degree in foreign languages. And then uh, thanks to the Fulbright program, I did my master's in teaching English as a second language at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And currently I'm doing a um, doctoral program in educational leadership and policy analysis at the University of Missouri in Columbia. And uh, this uh, degree has two tracks, um, one in elementary and secondary education and a second track in higher education. And that's, that's where my research interest is currently. Um, and before I started with the presentation, I want to share my positionality statement just for you to know where I'm coming from with this topic and with this presentation. I'm an international educator whose research interest intersects the role of community college or what we call career technical education for upward social mobility with higher education access for underrepresented populations such as low income first generation and refugee students. In Honduras, I have worked 
for precisely higher education access for low-income students and also professional development for teachers. Okay, so let's dive in and let's start uh, talking about CTE. Um, let's first define what CTE is, um, what, what it's also called uh, VT in all in, in other contexts, but it's the, the, the two terms are interchangeable, um, career technical education and vocational educational training. Okay. So um, CTE also referred as VET at the post-secondary level is one of the mod modalities for higher education that has become increasingly favored in several parts of the world. Uh, so this is a current trend, a global trend. And CT is an uh, educational pathway that provides students with academic, technical, and real world knowledge and experience. CT gives students training for different types of careers, as we can see in the diagram there with the clusters um, in, in, in all high growing industries, such as science and technology, healthcare, business, education, uh, information technologies, hospitality and tourism, et cetera, et cetera. There is a wide range of options of CTE programs nowadays. So we'll take a quick look at some programs in different universities in different regions of the world. And we'll start with the United States, what they called associate's degrees uh, in the United States. And here we have just an example of the um, um, amounts of earnings that people with an associate's degree can make. Uh, but if we look at Europe, there are also, there is a very strong emphasis on career technical education in Europe. Um, and we'll talk more in more detail about which countries are pioneers in CT in Europe, in the areas of biotechnology, um, robotics, um, accounting, uh, and marketing, etc. Now, if we take a look at Latin America specifically, we see uh, different universities offering um, uh, technical degrees um, in nursing, in healthcare, like radiology or uh, dental hygiene. Colombia also is a big um, promoter of career technical education in in Latin America, but also in our country, in Honduras, there are different universities that um, offer technical degrees in different areas. As you can see here, some examples are microfinance, um, therapy, radio, radio technology, um, hospitality, tourism, etc. So what's the literature gap here? What brings us here. Um, usually, um, there has been a misconception that uh, career technical education has, because it has ties with the private sector, which it does, it serves as, as the status quo in capitalist economies and hinders social mobility. But this literature review that I'm going to share with you for the first half of this presentation is going to explore the dynamics of career technical ed education, mostly in developed countries, uh, to determine that um, CTE does actually help social mobility in low-income students, and therefore the same effect could be extrapolated in developing societies such as ours. Um, so, First, we'll talk about the international standard classification of education. And this was, um, this is uh, different categories that UNESCO came up with uh, for um, all levels of education, starting with the preschool education and 
finishing with a doctoral degree, but we can see that CT programs um, are twofold. They are occupationally specific, thus preparing students to enter the labor market, but they are also a pathway to climb the ladder of higher education for those who aspire to obtain a bachelor's degree. So it's considered the first step uh, in higher education. What we have here, the technical vocational training, which can be uh, continued into an associate's degree and then a, a bachelor's degree. And uh, uh, <clears throat> If we take a look at what neoliberalism theory tells us about this uh, in the labor market, um, Thorsen and Lai define neoliberalism as a revival of liberalism, which entails the spread of global capitalism and consumerism. Uh, and another author, um, Avis, posits that career technical education is the modality of higher education with the closest relation to capital because of its tight focus on employability and waged labor, which is true, right? So the as we saw in the previous slide from UNESCO, one of the main focus of career technical education is precisely for people to get a job, right? And so because of this, um, the, the raison d'etre of uh, CTE programs is meeting the demands of the labor market. Consequently, they are considered gatekeepers on the ladder of the social mobility for low-income students. But we'll, we'll take a look at some um, examples of countries and how they design their um, career technical education programs. Um, due to the changing nature and flexibility of VET programs, the socioeconomic and labor market perspectives have widened, contributing to the enhancements of skills, competencies, and attitudes of students, but also providing access to particular career and academic pathways. And this is um, this is taken from the European Center for the Development of, of Vocational Training, uh, and they have a really comprehensive document about the principles of um, vocational training, of career technical education, and the types of skills and competencies that should be included, being one of them language skills, which is what's going to... Um, occupy our time for the second half of the session, talking about specifically how English for specific purposes can fit in here. So um, in other words, uh, the enactment of neoliberal policies, we can say, or we can argue that is pervasive at all stages of public and private education, and therefore should not be attributed only to VET programs. As VET programs continue to evolve, this traditional notion that career technical education serves as a capitalist tool should be reassessed in my view. And so here we have the three main stakeholders in career technical education, what we call the iron triangle, um, educational institutions, government and the private sector. And depending on how influential one of these three stakeholders is over the other two, the results of CTE will vary among countries and will also show different outcomes in the country's economy. And we'll take a look at some of the examples of how this dynamic works. We'll start talking about Germany. Germany is a pioneer in career technical education. It has been for many, many decades. And uh, um, the main characteristics of uh, in Germany's career technical programs is that um, they are dual study programs, they are collectivist driven curricula, and they're STEM oriented, right? So if we um, are not familiar with this term, so dual study programs are courses that combine classes with on-site apprenticeships at local companies. So there is this 
um, all CTA programs have these two components, the um, theory or the classroom content, but also the practical component that's really um, heavily focused on CTA. So that's part of the, the one of the main characteristics there. In collectivist, it means that they receive a big influence from the private sector. And uh, as, as a general rule, the bigger the influence of employers and the private sector, the more limited the role of educational institutions, right? And um, STEM-oriented means that it's focused on science, technology, and mathematics, okay? Then we'll we'll explore a little bit about Sweden. Sweden is another big uh, country uh, that invests a lot of um, financial um, means and resources to uh, vocational education and training. This one is school based and is called statist driven curricula, um, which means that. Um, the schools are equipped to have these apprenticeships. The students don't need to go outside of the school to get the experience because they have well-equipped laboratories where they can practice the skills that they have learned in class. And state is driven uh, means that the state or the government um, has a really big say on how the curricula should be designed. Um, and it is, this is because they, they invest a lot of money and resources on this. So in a comparative study that we can see here from these authors, Chuan and Ibsen in, in 2022, they discovered that uh, a bigger unemployment effect in collectivist VET versus uh, statist, VET, and also lower adaptability to the changes of the labor market. So we saw uh, that, we just saw that Germany has been a pioneer in a collectivist driven curricula, but it has transitioned from collectivist to statist, which uh, involves more attention and financial investment from the German government. And one more example is Australia, which, which is another big country um, on career technical education. Australia's government also launched a reform in favor of VET programs at the secondary and post-secondary level levels. So it starts in sec at the secondary level. Um, and the goal here is to assist young people in securing their future by enhancing their transition from school to work with a broad range of pathways in the labor market and at the university level. So in, in all these countries, um, that's the, the main goal, to uh, have students or help students in getting um, a job right away, but also encouraging them to continue um, furthering their studies in um, perhaps a bachelor's degree, et cetera. What's the evidence of social mobility that CTE provides? So first we'll talk about employability rate. Um, the most salient outcome of career technical education is its employability rate. Um, individuals that complete uh, these kind of programs are more likely to be employed immediately after graduation than those individuals from general education programs. Um, but there is a limitation here that researchers have noticed. Um, and it's that even though VET graduates are able to find a job more rapidly, they will experience a higher level of unemployment in their later years if they do not further their education. So it is important that people who graduate from CTE programs, they are encouraged to continue studying um, to be able to meet the demands of the labor market and um, polish their skills and keep their jobs. The starting salary rate is another advantage 
or evidence of social mobility in this study about uh, labor market outcomes. Zimmerman showed that VET graduates have a fairly higher advantage in starting salary at the beginning of their careers than those who graduate from a general track in secondary schools. This study is in Germany. Um, again, the same study shows that the students who graduate um, from these programs are less likely to seek a university degree because they are more focused on employability. Um, and then if we look at the United States, there are 30 million jobs in the US that do not require a bachelor's degree that pay a median job uh, or earning of $55,000 or more per year. And then as we said uh, earlier, um, another reason why uh, an associate degree or a CT program is beneficial is that it can transfer into a bachelor's degree. In the US, 80% of community college students um, aspire to transfer to a four-year institution. And only um, in California, the cross-enrollment policy um, specifies that any full-time uh, community college student in good standing um, can take courses while they're studying at the community college and transfer to formal admission to a university um, with the same cost. But there are also, also some challenges of CT. There, uh, there has to be a constant reevaluation uh, because the programs are designed to meet the demands of the market. And so this adaptation and this evaluation has to be really, really constant and very important. Um, there, there are still challenges around the transition or the transfer to four-year degrees. Uh, so there needs to be more work in that in that area that needs to be done, um, and also the ever-present issue of access to higher education, especially for minority groups, low-income students. It is um, so challenging as CTE or career technical education becomes more complex and technological. And so given these many issues in higher education regarding access, retention rates, attrition rates, um, student debt in some countries, uh, CTE represents an alternative that leaders in higher education institutions should explore more in depth, especially the process by which students get credit from their uh, programs and that would transfer to a four-year institution. And uh, so, all this um, information that I'm sharing with you here is from um, my current doctoral uh, studies in uh, career technical education, but we'll now take a look at the more um, English instruction side of things. But before we do that, just let me finish this part with some conclusions about this literature review that has, fo has focused on um, the advantages of career technical education, its impact on social mobility, especially for low-income students, for migrants, minority groups, and we've explored first world countries such as Germany, Sweden, Australia, um, China, and the United States. But there is also ample empirical evidence that disadvantages um, in terms of social mobility are significantly greater in developing countries where unemployment rates are usually staggering and many students seeking higher education come from humble backgrounds. And I could witness this with my own eyes in Honduras. So uh, people usually, they study because they want to get a better job. And so, um, career technical education um, shows uh, or is a, it's a better option for, or an, uh, an appealing option, I should say, for students from uh, humble backgrounds, low-income students, 
that can't afford to be uh, at university for four or five years without a job. Um, they just get to a two-year job, they get a job um, to a two-year program, get a job, and then if they want to continue with uh, pursuing a bachelor's, they can. Uh, besides immediate employment, career technical education student allows students to further their education should they should they desire to do so, and consequently the transfer process from um, a technical degree to a bachelor's degree needs to be um, enhanced. That process needs to be smooth, and that's not always the case. Um, uh, in the U.S. or in Honduras as well. The constant development of new technologies has driven CTE programs to become more rigorous, providing students with technical skills that can be used not only in a specific job, but also through a lifetime. So with the development of technology and the incorporation of technology in many industries, um, career technical programs um, are now more um, technology based and uh, it's not as it was done in the past where um, a student only learned skills for a specific post or specific job, but now it's becoming more integral and well-rounded. Okay, and so how does the um, ESP become an integral part of career technical education? So now we'll take a look at this. And um, for, for this section, uh, we should keep in mind the background information that I just shared with you. Um, but we'll start defining ESP, okay? Uh, English for specific purposes research is focused on language use in professional and occupational spheres. Um, and this, this has been part, ESP is a branch of um, ELT, of English language teaching that um, has been for many years and the research is, has been done um, a lot. Um, especially for academic purposes, but we want to bring this specific branch into career technical education. The main focus of ESP is to make explicit the demands of disciplinary, professional, and occupational language. And this is taken from this wonderful book that I fully recommend for people who are practitioners and administrators who are interested in this topic. These authors published a really, really good book that I um, referenced at the end um, about the integration of ESP in career technical education. They precisely noted that gap. There is this research gap. There is. They say that there is little of the existing research on vocational language um, that is in the ESP tradition. So if we see the two different kinds of research that has been done, ESP research and also vocational, educational and training, there is little research about this intersection of these two, which is much needed as we can see. So, um will as we talk about curricular design um we'll keep in mind the the iron triangle that i shared with you before um about the role of employers versus the role of government and in this case us as educators or educational institutions um in that it, um, employers should not have a bigger say than educators or uh, government. Um, and as we, you know, if you are involved in curriculum design in some capacity, or perhaps you are a 
faculty member uh, at a high school or at a university that works with these kinds of programs, then it's very important that the faculty's role or the education, the educational institution as a whole has the bigger influence, we can say. Um, so the following information that I'm going to share with you about curricular design guidelines, the advantages and challenges of ESP implementation and the recommendations that um, I have at the end of this presentation, they, um, they come from my own experience working with this type of programs, overseeing academic quality of courses, but they are also supported in the in the literature. Okay. So at the program level first, um, there has to be a, a clear teaching and learning philosophy. So that's the that's the first thing I feel it and it's it's paramount that uh, the English program at a given institution, let's say a school or a high school or a university, they have a clear teaching and learning philosophy for language, right? And that's going to um, mold everything else. And then um, what are the language goals and the desired level that you want the students in your career technical education program to have at the end of the program, right? Because if we talk about nursing students, so they're going to learn the um, skills that they need, the competencies that they need for taking care of patients. But if we decide to include the ESP, English for Specific Purposes, if they have a language requirement, what is a language language goal? What do we want students to know at the end of this program? And what level, what's the desired level? And the reason I have um, referenced there the, the CEPHER is because um, this, as you can see here, this text that I included um, on the corner, this comes from the current uh, regulations of career technical education in Honduras. So this is this is um, this was published uh, in the Gaceta and this was published by the Higher Education Bureau. And so you can see there in the um, article 33 they mandate that all career technical programs should follow a competency model. And then in Article 36, they say that all the competencies, whether they are generic or general competencies or specific competencies, they should be defined according to international references. So not only for the English classes or language classes, but all classes in a given program should follow international references. And so the CEPHER is the um, framework that we know as that is the, the most comprehensive for language teaching and language acquisition. So that's only an option. Of course, there are others that you can decide to use, but if you want to have clear language goals and desired level, use a specific framework such as the CEPHER to help you in that process. We already talked about having comp a competency-based um, program overall, um, especially for career te technical education, it is mandated. And so um, a language class, an English class is by nature a competency-based um, subject, right? So making sure that our syllabi aligned with, aligned with um, a competency-based approach. Then there are two choices that you can, um, according to my experience, right, that you can follow. You could do um, English for general purposes with an ESP component. So having a 
normal, regular English class that has in an ESP component from the start, or you could do um, first only general English to give students the base that they need and then follow up with ESP courses or like content courses um, in English um, about a specific field. So if it is, if these are business students then have courses related to business that are taught in English um, or nursing or um, customer service or uh, whatever the field is. Another important part of the curricular design would be the didactic materials that you want to use. There are a lot of options, a myriad of options of textbooks from publishing houses, depending on um, the subject. So there are so, uh, textbooks for business English or legal English or agricultural English, etc. So it's that's also part of the decision if you are going to um, use those or perhaps uh, design in-house materials uh, that are more tailored at the needs of your students in your context in your um, city etc um, and then technology also techno what technological tools are available to students um, and teachers that they can use in their classes um, that's also a big big part of the major decisions at the program level um, when designing a program that includes ESP. And so uh, if we look at another article from these um, regulations from um, for career technical education in Honduras, we see that there is a minimum and maximum amount of hours for the program. And this includes all the courses, right? In the, usually there are two years two-year programs. So this includes all the general courses and also the specific courses that the program needs. And also we have the language courses, right? So think about that. That's a very important part, but also it goes back to what is the goal that you want for the students? What do they need? Do they need more speaking? Are they going to be in contact with people or is it more like a solitary position where they just need more reading and writing so depending on that then you will make a decision of how many hours the students will need of english instruction and uh, and depending on the level so if you want students to get to an a2 level which is an elementary or perhaps you want them to have a b1 level which is intermediate uh, in in this in the table below, we can see um, the guiding learning hours table, which correlates to a specific level in the Sefer. So, for example, if if I want my students to get a B one level or intermediate, then they will need approximately three hundred fifty to four hundred guided learning hours, right? Um, so these include the classes that they have with their teachers in any any outside um, class or content um, related um, exposure that they have. And so so it is virtually impossible for technical degrees to get to an proficient or advanced level because they would need this amount which is the almost the whole amount of the program. Um, so that's this is a this is one of the main or the most important decisions is how many hours are they going to take and how many courses. So how are those hours going to be divided in, in how many courses? Even though there are you know these major 
um, decisions to take. There are also there are of course advantages to the inclusion of ESP in CTE curricula. Um, if you have a really good plan and a really good vision of the English for Specific Purposes program for your um, for your technical um, education, then you will end up with really focused English courses that are not just you know general courses, but they have um, a specific goal in mind for the students to know, which will um, inevitably end up in meaningful learning for the students and increase the higher motivation levels in students, which as we know, it's one of the um, challenges that uh, we language educators have to deal with. Uh, the most is sometimes the students are not motivated to learn, but if we include um, content that is meaningful to them, that they know that they're going to use and need in the real job, then their motivation is undoubtedly going to um, increase. Um, faculty collaboration, I included this because um, it is an, uh, a consequence of including um, ESP courses, um, especially if this is something that hasn't been done before, um, involving the faculty and um, using them as um, their expertise, following their advice, um, that collaboration is going to result in a really good experience for the for the team, creating good rapport as a team of faculty, but also is going to benefit the the whole program as 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 a as a whole. And then um, an evident advantage is that um, there is competitiveness for everybody. Um, as we have or tailor English classes that are more related to a specific uh, field, then those students will be more competitive to get a job um, and uh, perhaps uh, get a uh, even get a job abroad um, if their English is really proficient, uh, but also, Faculty, the faculty will become more expert in ESP and also the program in the school, the institution. So everybody benefits from having um, this kind of this kind of curriculum. Of course, there are some challenges along the way of implementation of ESP, uh, and we talked about the one of the most important ones, which is the number of hours allocated to ESP. This is a decision that is not easy and cannot be made by one person or one party. It has to involve the administrators, school administrators, um, uh, faculty, um, employers, a number of people who are not only uh, in charge of designing the English program, but the whole, the whole plan, they, they, there needs to be a discussion about the number of hours. And that's not an easy discussion. Uh, student readiness is also another challenge because uh, for, for some programs, students enroll in a particular program, for example, um, electrical, uh, technician, right? And that's that's what they want to study. That's what they want to learn. That's the job that they want. But if it's decided that they need some English component because maybe they need to be able to um, understand and decipher manuals and learn technical vocabulary, then that um, sometimes students uh, need a little bit of remedial courses 
to get that letters literacy level in their native language in Spanish before they can move to to English. So student so student readiness sometimes uh, could be a challenge, and there has to be a plan for those students who need these remedial courses. Leadership support, um, the whole leadership team of an educational institution, being the principal, or if it's a higher education institution, um, deans and the, the leadership team needs to really be involved in support the English program when they want to incorporate ESP as, as a main part of the program. Faculty's training and willingness. So the faculty needs professional development to be able to um, really uh, implement English for specific purposes, um, especially if there are different fields. Um, and also they need to be also willing to take on this, this challenge. And also extracurricular activities are, ne are needed, especially because the limited number of hours for the English class. And But if the students are interested and they really want their, um, to practice the language more, they can do so outside of the class. And so uh, extracurricular activities are, um, are a, a really good option there for extra practice. When we talk about instruction now, the, in, the actual implementation in the classroom, we already know these four skills. So making sure that you target uh, the four skills because it's a competency-based uh, approach, but also looking at sub skills such as grammar, pronunciation, and vocabulary. Vocabulary here is very important in um, career technical education because uh, it can give students with um, a big bag of technical terms and phrases that they can use. Um, so that has to be uh, taken into account from the beginning. Uh, and then this is depending on if you decide to do the class with the ESP component or just an English class. And then when the students are, you feel that they're more ready, then include specific courses only for technical vocabulary or, or the like. But in some capacity, these four skills and sub skills need to be part of the of the equation. And also now with all the apps and websites and tools and software that are available to all of us, then technology is key. Technology is paramount. It needs to be present in the classroom, especially for um, uh, an English for specific purposes uh, perspective and also from a career technical education perspective. From this part then, uh, we can say that ESP should be considered as the approach for English instruction in career technical education programs. Um, and we know that in Honduras, there are these kinds of programs that also start at the secondary level. So even in secondary, there should be an ESP component there and uh, then a stronger emphasis at the post-secondary level. ESP makes students, academic programs, and educational institutions more competitive, and the implementation of ESP um, in career technical education requires a great deal of planning, support, and constant monitoring for academic quality. And I will, um, a last conclusion would be that CT is a global trend um, worldwide and Honduras must keep up with the latest educational approaches, especially in going with the theme of this conference in a post pandemic era where more technological tools are available for language acquisition. I have uh, three recommendations for stakeholders 
for government, more research is needed in the intersection of career technical education and ESP, English for Specific Purposes. For educational institutions, we need to revise the curricular content of ESP courses, and we need to enhance them, incorporating technological tools when possible um, to take advantage of every guided learning hour for teachers, practitioners, administrators, get more professional development in this area. Um, if you're teaching uh, CT students in some capacity. These are my references. And uh, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank everybody involved in this conference, the planning committee, um, especially Dr. Gloria Ulloa. And um, if you have any, any questions about this topic, feel free to reach out. Um, my email is in the first slide. Here you can contact me at jjreyesvalladares7 at gmail.com. Thank you very much and have a great rest of your conference.